Major layoffs are hitting ESPN and some big names are leaving the organization. It's Thursday, May 25th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter and this is Front Office Sports Today. The face of ESPN is changing because many faces are leaving. Here to give us the inside scoop is senior writer Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Uh, great to be here, Owen. I wish it was uh, better news. Uh, layoffs are always sad and debilitating for everybody involved, and my heart goes out to these folks. Yeah, another hard day at the Worldwide Leader. So what do we know so far about this latest round of layoffs? Well, the second round of layoffs has kicked in this week. Uh, again, it's going to focus, Owen, on top executive talent, VP and above, uh, off-camera talent, perhaps a few on-air talents, but really it's going to be you know off-camera people. Uh, the one new name that we're hearing is Barry Blinn. He's a very well-respected vice president of sports research and analytics, and uh, he follows some major names from the first cut in late April, which included beloved communications guru Mike Saltis, uh, Nate Silver of 538, Russell Wolf, who headed up uh, International, and John Dahl, who is the executive producer on the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, which was a, a smash hit during the pandemic. And I know you've been scrambling today to confirm names and try to get this all hammered out. Can we say anything about any of the on-air talent that will be leaving? I don't think uh, their turn has uh, come quite yet. I think that's going to start in about a week or two, Owen. Uh, the way it's been explained to me is going to be two rounds of cost cuts, and then the talent is going to be a whole separate uh, cost-cutting exercise. So they're going to basically get their own spotlight. Uh, you know, I think it's premature to uh, uh, you know mention any names. You know, we did uh, break the news today that as a result of Pat McAfee. Uh, moving to ESPN, it's likely that Max Kellerman's This Just In afternoon show will be axed. Um, I think we're, we're a week or two away and, you know, up there, you know, the mood is grim. People have their fingers crossed, Owen. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, uh, tough times. And why is this happening? Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, uh, what people have to understand about the ESPN layoffs is that this is be being mandated from Burbank. This is coming from Disney 3,000 miles away. Disney made strategic mistakes, and now the whole company is looking to shed 7,000 jobs and cut $5.5 billion in costs. Well, ESPN, which has contributed billions to the bottom line, is part of Disney. So uh, if they're going to be part of Disney during the good times, they have to be part of Disney during the hard times. So even though these layoffs are no fault of their own, their uh, folks are bearing the brunt along with uh, other people out there. I, I think the second reason, uh, Owen, is ESPN's business model is in trouble. The old dual revenue stream of 100 million homes plus advertising has shrunk to 73 million homes. And who knows where the bottom will be as a result of cord cutting. It could go down to 50, 60 million homes. So all that money has to be replaced somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, of course, they're they're moving more and more toward putting just all of ESPN on streaming on ESPN plus. Exactly. Uh, but that money is that streaming money is it's not going to be the same number of people. And those people aren't going to contribute the same number of money, the same amount of money as as cable subscribers. Well, here's the dirty little secret about streaming. You know, everybody says streaming this, streaming that, streaming is the future. Yeah. Tell me how you monetize it. You make a hell of a lot more money from uh, commercials on broadcast television or cable television than you do from commercials on streaming. And as we saw with that uh, snafu over the weekend, where the one half of one uh, entire game went out, you know, streaming still has a lot of uh, kinks to be ironed out. So I'm not sold on the streaming future quite yet. In fact, I think as we enter into these uh, new broadcast negotiations for the NBA, I think broadcast TV, you know, good old fashioned broadcast with the, the rabbit ears is looking pretty good again. Yeah. And with ESPN, they could charge $10 a month per subscriber to cable companies. And they're not getting that uh, for the most part from ESPN Plus, even for people who are specifically buying ESPN. Uh, let's jump quickly over to um, the NBA playoffs. So we had 
you know, marquee teams, marquee, marquee matchups in the first and second rounds, but now the Lakers are gone, Warriors are gone, Knicks are gone. Uh, what does this mean for, for NBA playoff ratings? It's really been a, a magical run. Uh, ESPN has had its best NBA playoff ratings in 11 years. Uh, that game four the other night with the Nuggets and Lakers had the biggest audience in eight years for a game four. Uh, but, you know, I have to wonder if the run is coming to an end. You know what I mean? You've got uh, two teams that aren't that big, uh, you know, uh, attraction wise. And if the Celtics lose tonight, you know what I mean? You could have a significant layoff between the end of the conference finals and the beginning of the NBA finals. Now, that could work two ways. You know what I mean? It could decrease interest in finals. Or in Super Bowl-like fashion, where you have that two-week layoff, it could generate storylines and suspense. But uh, I, I don't think the NBA is thrilled with the matchup of these two teams. I think if you gave them a truth serum, they'd love uh, Steph or uh, LeBron to be in there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the silver lining for me is a lot of people are learning to love the Nuggets. They're a fun team. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Let's hit a few quick headlines before the interview. The Oakland A's and Nevada legislative leaders announced that they had a deal around funding for a new stadium on the Las Vegas Strip. The state and county will chip in around $325 million, with the team funding roughly $1.2 billion for the stadium, which would be publicly owned. No legislation has been filed at the time of recording, and legislators have not committed to approving the project, but the momentum is certainly toward making that happen. I have a lot to say about how this all went down, but I'll save that for when they get the final approval, assuming that happens. To the Southeast, in a poetic moment, Shaquille O'Neal was served papers on the FTX lawsuit in what was, until recently, FTX Arena, before Tuesday's Heat Celtics playoff game. Shaq is being sued for his role in boosting FTX, along with other luminaries, including Steph Curry and Tom Brady. And Honda is coming back to Formula One. It's teaming up with Aston Martin starting in 2026, which, not coincidentally, is when F1 will change its engine regulations to nearly triple the amount of electrical power supplied by its engines. There is a lot going on in the world of professional teams moving or coming into existence, and a lot of what happens around those deals is usually a black box for most of us who are watching from the outside. My upcoming guest, Erwin Kishner, has three decades of experience helping teams negotiate stadium deals, and he will give us a look inside that black box. We'll have that conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash front office. We have a lot of teams in uncertain situations, and here to help us shed some light on that is Erwin Kishner, co-chair of the Sports Law Group with Herrick Feinstein. Uh, welcome, Erwin. Uh, welcome. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure to be here, Erwin. So just to, to get us oriented a little bit here, will you tell us a little bit about the work you do with, with teams? Uh, sure. Uh, my firm uh, has had a sports law practice for well in excess of 50 years at this point. I've been with the firm for a little bit over 30 of those years. And uh, during that time, we've had the good fortune to work with some of the most uh, distinguished and well-known brands in sports. Um, as well as uh, be immersed in the industry. And that means in representing senior secured lenders. It means representing concessionaire companies. It means helping teams build their stadiums or arenas. It means helping with their sponsorship or naming rights deals. It's really a, if you will, a 360 uh, degree look at the sports industry. And my firm has participated in that uh, for quite some time. And if 
my work at FOS here is any indication that that work has not gotten any less busy in the last, you know, 10 years or yeah, so. You know, one of the beauties of, of, of the sports world is, you know, it's, it's always uh, in a, if you will, a constant state of evolution. So um, fortunately for, for us, there, there always seems to be uh, areas where we could lend assistance and, and help execute business folks' uh, goals. All right. So let's take a look at some of the uh, evolving situations, let's say, in the sports world. So one that is more settled than some of the other ones we're going to talk about, uh, San Diego is getting a major league soccer team. The reporting around that is that they um, there is a $500 million expansion fee that that team is paying to the league, which completely blows that out of the, the previous record, which was, I think, $325 million in Charlotte. How are these expansion fees negotiated? Like, how, when do how do they arrive at a number? It's a great question. Okay, and and there is no, if you will, scientific formulaic basis. Uh, expansion fees are governed by the laws of supply and demand. And um, if a, there are a limited number of franchises and there are a number of folks that are competing for that, that by natural uh, economic forces are going to drive up the expansion fee. Now, any league is always going to want to show as part of their evolution uh, a continuing growth of the expansion fee, i.e. interpreting that the league itself is becoming more and more valuable. So seeing numbers like we're seeing, $500 million, um, is not at all surprising. But I mean, again, over the last 25 years, um, from Little Acorns Grow Mighty Oaks, um, that the Major League Soccer has really done some fantastic work and is getting more and more popular. And by the way, I think we'll continue to get more and more popular, particularly with the World Cup uh, right around the corner. So it's not, uh, you know, there's no science to it. It's uh, it's what uh, people are willing to pay. And that's that's what we're seeing in San Diego. And is there any risk to for that fee to get too large for MLS or is, is that just money in the bank? Uh, I, I don't think, I mean, look, if you look at the values of franchises and um, what that means, um, it's going to obviously be related to that. I, I, I don't see that uh, anytime in the future. I think you could always adjust it and there are that, that fee. In other words, it doesn't mean necessarily uh, that that fee is all paid on day one. Um, you can still have a high franchise fee and continuing growth of the franchise fee, but what if it's paid in installments? And there's no rule against how that necessarily is going to be paid. And so let's stay in the Southwest. So the Arizona Coyotes recently um, lost a vote uh, that would have, would have allowed them to build a whole you know, new arena, first and foremost, and a development around that. Uh, which is, you know, the the new model of if you don't just ever build a stadium anymore. Um, well, you, you do it if you're the A's, I guess. But um, but yeah, it's, it's apartments, hotels, housing, restaurants. Um, uh, so they wanted to do one of those. Uh, but for now, they are stuck at Arizona State University, where they play in front of around 5,000 fans, which is a third of any other NHL team. Uh, so... What do they do now? Um, I mean, I'm not asking you to, you know, be a fly on the wall in their in their room, but um, but yeah, do so. They they may try to stay in Arizona. They might move. What, what's what leverage does this team have in terms of um, you know their next move? Well, I think first off, I think that it I was on I, it was unfortunate for at least from my vantage to hear that Arizona turned down the proposal to build a new building for for for, for the their team. I mean, um, you know, having a privilege of having an NHL franchise in a city is a is is really in my view uh, elevates the city. It brings economic activity. Uh, you, people have used terms like it it affects the Keynesian multiplier because you need people to to help. Serve service the, the, the concessions, it helps service the merchandise, it brings economic activity. So when I see things like cities turning down uh, bills like this to keep a team, um, it, it, I, I think it's, it's a, you know, not the right move. That said, um, what it does create is a potential situation where our, the Coyotes may, in fact, decide to pick up and leave. And um, from what I'm hearing and from what I'm seeing, there are a number of cities out there 
that would be quite interesting. Look, Phoenix and the Phoenix area or Arizona and the Arizona area is a major population center and one that could support a major or a National Hockey League team. The fact that um, they don't have a building, though, it directly affects it, the team on a number of different levels, not just economically, which it does, but it also has an effect on trying to attract player talent, saying, well, why would I want to play in a building of 5,000 for my own, for my own uh, um, you know, economic benefit? And it, it, it creates a situation where the team itself can't afford as much lucrative salaries and, and talent and, and ultimately be as competitive as other teams. So I, I think it's a, it's an unfortunate situation, what I'm seeing in Arizona. It, it's going to get resolved one way or the other way. And that resolution may, in fact, involve the Coyotes moving to another city. Yeah. And speaking of teams moving, I sort of cheekily mentioned the A's a moment ago. They were going to spend around $12 billion to, um, or at least that was the plan, to develop the Oakland waterfront, including a new stadium. Um, it now, it seems the momentum is very much toward them um, uh, just building a stadium on nine acres of land provided by Bally's. I guess the the question that that I, you know, keep coming back to with all this is that same supply and demand question of how does a, a city and a county and a, a state, how do they decide what is it worth spending to keep this team? Because Nevada has to spend, you know, something like $300 million to bring the A's. Uh, Oakland was was trying to put together around five hundred million to to do their their end of the bargain. Um, so yeah, how do you arrive at that number? Yeah, you, you know this is a question that has been debated for well over a hundred years now um, about public private finance of stadiums and arenas and, and the like. And the question is, is there enough benefit to the citizenry to dedicate limited amount of funds? to uses like building a stadium versus um, for other public purposes, whether it be schools or improving roads or hospitals or whatever other worthy purposes those funds can be used. Um, that said, um, you know, you have, there is always a balancing act. And uh, this was, you know, th this, this question, uh, you know, was, was debated even with the Roman Colosseum. Um, the Roman Colosseum was a publicly financed building, uh, albeit many thousand years ago, uh, but it was deemed by the Roman Senate to be worthy of public finance. It, it, it was to, to that brought honor. It was a place of congregation. It was a place uh, that, 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 we made it known and, and, and elevated the prestige of the city from all around. Now, obviously, I'm not applying, you know, this to, you know, to, to, to today's world. It's a very, very different, very much more complicated world. However, you still face these same rules and regulations. There have been times where the United States government, the Senate and the House have actually debated bills prohibiting public use of money for sports teams. The, the argument being, well, why should we, uh, you know, uh, publicly finance buildings when uh, only the owners are getting the benefits uh, of this? The counter to that is what I alluded to earlier. Um, I believe that when you have these developments and talk about the Oakland waterfront, which is just a, a place that is ripe for, for development, how wonderful would it be to have a waterfront area with a centerpiece, call it a new Oakland A's stadium that would have hotels and restaurants and music and entertainment, and it would just be a driver of, of tourist dollars, it would be, and everybody gets elevated. That to me is, is the much better and much more compelling argument from, from where I sit, um, but others have different views. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's a right answer. I mean, all I have to do is open up my Twitter notifications to have, find someone saying, don't give any money to a billionaire. <laughs> like they, they've got the money themselves. Uh, but yeah, but there is the, uh, the demand side of the market where, well, they, they've got demand in Oakland, they've got demand in Vegas, they'd have demand in Portland or Charlotte or anywhere they wanted to go. So to the degree, to the degree that these teams are mobile, they can say, well, if, if you want me, you, you, you got to give me something for it. So it's a tricky balance. You know, some people call it extortion. Some people call it a win-win deal. It's, and I feel like it, it can be both or it can be either depending on the actual deal. Uh, you, you could argue both sides of it, undoubtedly. 
Um, I think, though, when you apply the balance of equities and the prestige it brings to a city and the rallying cry it brings to a city and the, uh, you know, the, the just elevating to me, it's not it's not as close as some pretend. But I fully recognize the other side of this and saying I have limited dollars. Let's use it for something else. And let's not worry about, uh, you know, all those other things that I think are so important. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's it is a healthy debate and will continue to be for well, for until the next Roman Coliseum. I think. All right. Erwin Kishner, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. That's it for today. Rate us on your podcast app. Tell your friends to check us out. Thanks for listening and we will see you tomorrow.